Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, uh, welcome to the spring quarter for the Smart Grid Seminar. So, uh, in the in the in the past few years for Smart Grid Seminar, we always invite uh, guest speakers to Stanford and uh, give talks on different topics. And uh, so, this quarter we are going to do slightly different. Have uh, some of our researchers and uh, even senior PhD students to talk about. Uh, the, you know, the awesome work they have done and they have been doing here. And uh, one main purpose of uh, this type of uh, presentation is to really uh, try to unlock the open source, open innovation we have done at the different parts of the Stanford related to energy system. So in the next uh, uh, two months, we're going to hear five to six different uh, products, open source products produced uh, uh, through Stanford research and the students in the past uh, four or five years. So um, get us started with the first uh, product we're going to, first products, I would say this way, not just one, it's actually it's two we're going to talk about, from uh, Jack in uh, Shannon. And uh, Jack was the first fellow, graduate student fellowship awardee for the Bits and Watts, and uh, uh, working with uh, Professor uh, Sally Benson and uh, and Peter in the last uh, uh, four or five years and did uh, a lot of interesting work and uh, both globally and also hands on into the Stanford Energy System. So uh, now he is an uh, anchor professor here at Stanford and also work at uh, the cloud managers. So the topic today for Jack's talk are going to share with us <coughs> two interesting work. One is on the Stanford Energy System. Another one is uh, uh, the platform and he created a call the real time emission tracking system. So, without further ado, I will hand this over to Jack. So, thanks, uh, Liang. So, actually, um, actually, I think I'm going to try to focus on one of the two products and see how, you know, how long that takes me. And, you know, and, and if I have time, maybe I'll talk a little bit more about the second. Um, and I guess for, so for, so I, I gave a talk on Monday on uh, some of our stuff around the campus energy system. So, I, I, I won't talk too much about that. Um, I'll talk mostly about uh, this work on tracking emissions in the uh, uh, US electricity system, which started um, actually when we were thinking about the campus energy system. So it's all very, uh, very, uh, very linked. Um, and so I don't know how we usually do uh, questions in this seminar, but I guess I'm, uh, you know, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, I think you know, if questions are too long, maybe I'll keep them for the end. Otherwise, I'll be known the uh, beginning. And, and actually, one last thing before I start, um, and I guess to all the students, whether in the room or online, I'm always looking for students. You know, so if anything here is interesting to you, please uh, uh, please contact me. You know, if you want to do uh, research, we're, we're looking for people. Um, so okay, so today, uh, okay, so kind of the starting point for some of this, or I guess the context, which I'll talk a tiny bit. Uh, at the beginning, but is, is really sort of motivation for this is um, the Stanford campus, which is uh, roughly equivalent to a 30,000 people city. Um, and in California, the reason I say 30,000 people, I'm looking at uh, the campus's total electricity consumption, which is the, the, you know, really one of the things I care about when I look at the Stanford campus. Um, and uh, and it's, a, it's a great place. Uh, it's a great place to do research um, and uh, experiments, whether real life or uh, thought experiments because, um, well, the Stanford system has, is sort of a, an island in the sense that uh, there's one distribution system, one substation for the campus, two transformers off of it, one that goes to the central energy plant where we produce the heating and cooling for the campus, uh, one that goes to the uh, 100 plus buildings uh, uh, that, that are on the campus. It's also an island in the sense that there's um, central management. You know, we, we have this almost, uh, uh, totalitarian regime, you know, with one president making decisions for everything that happens on campus, and that means you can do, uh, you know, you can do experiments, you can test things out uh, in a way that might not be so easy um, in a democratic system. You know, so, so that's one of the things I like about uh, the Stanford system, and, and and this is my sort of, you know, the, my rough schematic for uh, what's in on, on this campus. On the bottom uh, middle there are the campus buildings. Um, so depending on how you count, uh, 100 to 150 of those, uh, and the bottom right. Uh, the central energy plant, uh, which is almost fully electric. Uh, there was a major overhaul um, starting in 2014, completed in 2015, uh, to go from what was before, which was a cogeneration system um, using gas, to uh, a 
an almost fully electric system using uh, heat pumps, uh, big industrial heat pumps to produce the heating and cooling that's sent through uh, pipes, uh, about 10 miles of pipes uh, around the, the campus buildings. And then to the left on the bottom there, we also have these different um, these different systems uh, that, are either, that are consuming electricity that are either uh, active, uh, actively managed today or, or that we're thinking of uh, managing actively uh, in the near future. And then from the outside, uh, we get gas, we get uh, electricity, we get water. The, the one I'm going to think, you know, really think about uh, today is the power. And one of the key things is the, the carbon intensity uh, associated with the power coming over that line. Uh, what are the to try to get a sense for um, what are the, the operating emissions, if you like, of Stanford's electricity? Uh, so why why does this matter? And, and this is uh, this is kind of sort of the base uh, uh, that I uh, uh, that we started with. The thing about this, which is how do we manage? Uh, how do we schedule? You know, if I have to go in every day and schedule uh, the electricity going to the machines and the central energy plant. And so there are different types of machines, some to produce just cooling, some just heating, some uh, we use both the heating and the cooling. Uh, but apart from the hot water generators that run mostly on gas with a tiny bit of electricity for the fans, the other uh, types of machines are all heat pumps, uh, different types of industrial heat pumps. So almost only electricity is the keyword. You know, that, that building uses up to 15 megawatts of power. So um, uh, up to 45% of the campus's Power consumption is uh, from the CEF, the Central Energy Plant, and up to, and I think it's roughly 20 to 25 percent, depending on the year of our energy uh, in terms of electricity, is is with that plant. So it's a big part of our of our uh, uh, electricity use, and it's fairly uh, flexible uh, because there's uh, uh, there's centralized thermal storage in that building uh, that can store from a couple hours to a day, depending on the season, uh, a day's worth of. Uh, heating and uh, cooling, and so that's hot water and, and cold water. So this this base problem is uh, how do I schedule uh, how do I schedule the different machines uh, in, inside that building, uh, subject to a, a set of uh, uh, different constraints. And and what I'm trying to minimize by default is uh, the campus's total electricity bill, which to um, to give you maybe a sense of scale is something like 20, 25 million uh, dollars per year. So you know so so. You know, if you can do one two percent on that electricity bill, you know, it's uh, I guess bigger savings than than at least my own. Um, so you know, so so it's worth it. In in, in other words, is that what I'm trying to say? You know, they're, they're, and, and and that that's something that um, that the people who manage the central energy plant are already doing. You know, they're already looking at how can we optimize those operations. Uh, one of one of the questions I'm going to be asking here is, uh, well, what if we wanted uh, that uh, that system to be used for other things, and uh, the sorts of things that you know they might want, you know, we might want to use it for, uh, are things like uh, reducing costs. So that I, I've talked a bit about um, uh, providing services to the grid. Uh, that I talked a bit about on on Monday, and I won't talk about it again today. Um, reducing carbon footprints, which is really what I'll talk about uh, uh, today, and or really thinking about what's the carbon footprint, not so much reducing the carbon footprint, um, is what I'll talk about today. And then things like uh, so uh, integrating electric vehicles. There, there's also some research doing that on, on campus, and I, I've done a bit of that as well. Um, and and uh, things like uh, uh, adapting to, to heat events, uh, also something I've, I've worked on, but I'm, I'm actively working on. But I, I won't talk about today, just to give you a sense of uh, different things you can think about with that system. Um, so so the what I really want to focus on today, and, and these are sure some some results kind of at the end uh, to give you a sense of where this is headed. Um, one of the so one of the things we did uh, back in so this was in 2018 2019 was uh, 2018 2019 was to uh, think well what if Stanford were to self impose a carbon price um, and uh, let's say we have a proxy for what the carbon content of the electricity we're purchasing it is how much difference would it make to change the operations at the central energy facility uh, to follow that carbon price and so what the uh, the picture on the left there is telling you. Uh, there are sort of two uh, uh, two ways you reduce emissions. One is well, now that Sanford is almost fully electric, just if the if the grid becomes cleaner, well, naturally, you know, sort of automatically, the, when you look at the, the, the carbon emissions associated with Sanford's operations, that just goes down because uh, the electricity we're getting is cleaner. And then second is um, this idea of carbon aware scheduling. If we start moving, and, 
And there, the idea is really if we start moving towards a grid in California where uh, there's a strong difference in the uh, carbon intensity of the grid between the daytime and the nighttime, then it will have value to uh, schedule operations in that way. In other words, to make um, you know to, to make heating and cooling when the when the sun shines. Um, and, and so the picture on the on the right was uh, a sort of first attempt back then at saying what's the so for California. Uh, what's the carbon intensity of the grid? So, so I won't talk about this picture too much because I'll, I'll show many more pictures like these um, in, in a bit. Uh, but, and so, so this was kind of some of the motivation here. And so one, one more slide on, on this to give you a sense of you know, why, why I care about the carbon intensity of the grid. Um, so on these, so these plots are basically showing you a summary for what's the total electricity consumption of the campus uh, over a full year. So this is, uh, and, and this is by solving uh, so this is the schedule that's generated by my optimization programs. Um, and, and this is a sort of a perfect foresight kind of uh, solution to uh, what you would do in the year of 2016, where each, uh, each, uh, uh, each column there is a day of the year in 2016, and each row is an hour of the day. Um, and so on the left is basically, so VAU, uh, that's business as usual. What, you know what? What uh, if you're just paying for electricity the way we pay for electricity today? What you should do, and uh, um, so without going into too much detail, uh, basically what the current structure, the current uh, tariff structure is telling us is try to be as flat as possible. So when you look at uh, the electricity consumption from this C uh, the central energy facility, basically try to do it as much as possible when the other buildings are consuming less power, so that the aggregate is as, as flat as possible, and then when the price of electricity is higher, which is in the afternoon, that's the sort of blue you see around 6 p.m. at the bottom, try to consume a bit less. Um, whereas the, the right plot is, okay, if I really, you know, I'm just tracking uh, carbon and, and say I was trying to minimize my footprint, what would I do? Well, you know, and, and this is in a scenario where we have, uh, assuming California has a lot more solar, this is sort of, you know, looking a bit uh, prospectively, um, well, try to consume as much electricity in the middle of the day. Another way to interpret the picture on the right, you know, I think is basically uh, if, Sam, if Sanford had on-site solar, uh, uh, well, we do have on-site solar, but if we had much more on-site solar, how much of that solar would we be able to just absorb ourselves in the middle of the day? Um, so all of that was kind of motivation to get to uh, what I'm really hoping to talking about today. I have roughly four minutes. Okay. Um, is uh, okay. Is, if I want to be able to do this kind of thing, if I want to be able to do carbon aware scheduling, I need to have some idea of what's the carbon intensity of the of the of the electricity that I purchase. So, in other words, I care about what's the carbon footprint of the electricity consumption. Um, and then, you know, actually, when you start thinking, so these are sort of more questions that come up when you start thinking about the carbon intensity of the grid. Um, Things like what's going to be the impact of renewables on grid carbon intensity, and so how is that going to change? Uh, but also, you know, as we started digging more and more into this work, uh, questions started coming up like what's the impact of renewables on other uh, generating units and on exchanges? That, that's uh, something I'm still working on very much today. And then, uh, of course, how are these uh, answers changing in time? Even just in the, so actually, it's a bit more than four or five years. I've actually been in Stanford for seven and a half years now, um, and. You know, even in that short, you know, shortish uh, time scale, now it's starting to be a bit longer. The answers have been changing quite a lot. You know, and 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 so having tools that can accurately track uh, what's happening in the grid is going to be super important. You know, and, and having relatively um, fresh information is also going to be super important. And so the, the map on the top right, that's sort of a, a teaser for for what's coming next. Uh, you know, we started off with I care about Stanford, but you know, and then we started pulling on a thread. And then to say, actually, we, we want to do this for the US. And so that, that map, and I'll talk about more about that map, what it means, but is, is looking at uh, what's the carbon footprint of electricity um, in, in different parts of the United States. So uh, why does this matter? Uh, this matters because uh, we, want to, uh, we want to manage carbon. And if we want to manage carbon, to manage carbon we need to be able to measure it. Uh, this is especially important since uh, we just want to electrify uh, everything out there right now. You know, like so. So heating is uh, heating and cooling is something that I look at a lot. Uh, electric vehicles are another big one. That's going to have 
uh, big impacts on uh, the power sector. It also means that a bigger part, if you look at entities like Stanford, a bigger part of their, um, what I call their operating emissions is going to be linked to electricity. So just measuring uh, the carbon content of electricity, which was already important, it is going to get even more important. And this, this sort of tool or you know, the, the unit that we care about here um, is what's, what are called emissions factors. And so emissions factors measure uh, the carbon content or, or the carbon emissions associated with um, electricity consumption or production in units of kilograms of CO2 uh, per uh, uh, megawatt hour of electricity. And this, is, this picture is just to give you a sense of, I guess these are numbers that I like to have in my head to get a sense of what's what. And, and, and so these are life cycle analysis um, estimates uh, from the IPCC. And you know, the, the bottom line for me is coal is roughly double, is you know, roughly a thousand, which is roughly double uh, gas, um, which is roughly an order of magnitude, you know, so you take out a zero to get to all of this. And so the other uh, so the other thing that we cared about there was uh, well, sorry, I mean, I'll, I'll get that actually in just a bit. Uh, in order to be able to do this sort of thing, um, we, we, we want to look at, um, uh, we, we need sort of two things. We need uh, data on emissions. So uh, CO2 that's historically been released uh, by burning fossil fuels to produce uh, electricity and then uh, electric grid uh, data. And so so th those are the two sources of information we were using to do this. Um, one thing I, I, I didn't talk uh, about yet is the difference between consumption and production based. Uh, accounting and uh, production based accounting of CO2 emissions um, is basically looking at what are also called territorial emissions. Uh, what are the emissions associated with electricity uh, production? The, the idea actually didn't really come from looking at electricity, looked at other things, but this work was applying this idea to electricity. And then consumption based emissions would be what are the, electric, uh, the, the electricity, uh, sorry, the emissions associated with electricity consumption. And so importantly, uh, there you start thinking about imports. And the reason this matters is when you're uh, in California, whether it's uh, running a job on the data center or uh, running the, the machines in the Stanford Central Energy Facility, uh, you're, you're using electricity, but electricity was put, you know, that grid that you're drawing power from is being energized by supplying electricity to it. But that could be, you know, in California, or in China, actually there's a mesh, you know, it's like it could be uh, much farther off inside that grid. And the, the, the the U.S. grid is roughly divided in three parts. There's sort of the, the west, the east, um, and then Texas is kind of by, by itself in the in the bottom there. And you know, and, and so really the, the whole western grid, the western interconnect, uh, WEC is is all uh, connected. So so imports matter if you want to think about the, uh, that in, in California. So this I, I kind of uh, I went through a, a bit a bit of between production and consumption based emissions. Um, so I'm going to show a succession of maps to kind of give, give you a sense of how I'm computing these estimates. So this here is showing uh, electricity consumption uh, in the U.S. So the circle there are represent so the side the area of the circles are representative of 2016 uh, electricity consumption, which is the, the data I was working with when I made this. And then the arrows here that I've added on top that's uh, exchanges of electricity, so electricity trade. And here are the width of the arrows. Is representative of how much electricity we're sending. So this is net transfer over the year 2016. And then, uh, uh, so this is what we were trying to get, uh, uh, consumption-based carbon intensity. So the color here is the carbon intensity of the grid. And do I have a mouse? Yeah. And then, and, and if you look at the scale at the bottom there, that's roughly from zero, you know, like is you know, less than 100 is green, all the way up to 1,000. And, you know, and so I said coal, you know, if you had uh, carbon intensity, of coal that would be roughly a thousand here, and then gas would be basically the the white. You know, so PJM is roughly equivalent to if it were just gas, and then you know the the very green like so here there's a lot of hydro is uh, less than a hundred, and so I won't talk too much today about how we made this map. The uh, I guess maybe one thing I'll just say is that um, somewhere you have to solve a, a linear system. Uh, what I will so um, what I will talk about more is. Um, in, in just a bit is, is how do we get it in, in real time. Um, but before, you know, why, why does it matter to, to get this? Uh, if you look, one thing you can, you can kind of see from the colors, but this picture is showing a bit more, is um, if you look at the US, 
there's a pretty big difference in the carbon intensity of the grid depending on where you are. And uh, so in, in 2016, according to this, the US average was roughly equivalent to gas. You know, so that was uh, kind of like PJM, the, the balancing area in the uh, Northeast. And if you're in a place like Bonneville Power um, on the far left, where there's a lot of uh, hydro and they also have a lot of wind, um, electricity is very clean. If you're in the central Rockies, um, there's a lot more coal. And so the carbon intensity of electricity is much sturdier. And so the, uh, on each of these, the, uh, uh, these are summary statistics for hourly data. So the, the circle is the median, and then the, the length of the line there is the 10th to 90th percentile over hourly data for a, a year. So what, so the, the and I'm going to have one uh, technical part uh, in, in this talking just a second, because I, I wanted to give a sense today of, you know, how do you, uh, how do you do this, you know, beyond just the, the great plots and the pictures, how do you get there? And then I'll, I'll get back to something that's a bit, uh, to, to some more results. But um, we, we wanted to be able to get this uh, in, in close to real time. So the plots I was showing earlier, that was, so that was data that we published in 2019, but was using data from 2016, because that was actually uh, sort of the, given what we were doing, the latest set of data that were available at the time. But one thing I said earlier is by the time you're in 2019, actually that data is already a bit outdated. So of course it's, it's interesting because, you know, you can like kind of look back uh, sort of before 2016, all the years where you have data, uh, how are things changing? But we also care about getting things that's much more uh, recent. And, you know, and, and, and there are a lot of uh, reasons why uh, we, we, we care about that. Uh, Roughly, what you know, this is giving you a sense of how uh, how to get these data. So there's some data on the left there, whether it's from the most of it from the it's from the EPA of Energy. Uh, um, sorry, the uh, what does EPA stand for again? The you know, environmental environmental, sorry, environmental environmental protection agency and EIA is Energy Information Administration. So two U.S. Um, agencies. Uh, so the EPA gives me data on emissions through the SEMS systems that are live sensors ins installed on, I think it's all power plants above 50 megawatts. And then the EIA I'm using to get uh, data uh, on the electric grid, uh, production, consumption, exchanges, and uh, e-grid. So, so these are uh, data sets that come out every couple of years that do a lot of consolidation, but at a pretty aggregate level. And so there are two steps, and I'll talk about the one on the top. One step is, uh, when I'm getting data that's much more recent, so data from uh, an hour ago, um, there are often issues with the data, so I need to find a way to reconcile the data to, to clean it up. And then two, I compute the, the consumption-based emissions, which uh, I said uh, involves uh, solving a, a linear system that's roughly the size of the network. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, just a quick question. How do you reconcile um, the production from coal power plants with the specific Tesco's that are buying it because I mean it's all one big power pool, right? So how do you know that the electrons that come from one specific coal plant are going to the specific Tesco? Is that just based on sort of the, uh, the purchase agreements between the two? Oh yeah. So that's a very good question. Um let me just share this while I talk. Um so uh the what I'm doing here is I'm trying to look at the the physical grid. So I'm not looking at power purchase agreements. I'm just looking at how much uh, power is injected in different nodes. So, so I'm just looking at the grid as an electric network and saying how much power is injected here and what's the carbon content associated with that. You know, so if you take like a, uh, the Midwest uh, Intimate System Operator here, I say what are all the power plants that were in here? How much CO2 are they emitting? And how much energy are they putting on that grid? And I also have between the nodes how much electricity is exchanged. And then basically, so I'm not, so in, in, so this is an, a, a non-market-based way of, this, uh, of attributing emissions, if you like. Here, I'm just looking physically, you know, if you're taking power from a grid, you know, you're getting everything there. You, know, you can't say, in, uh, well, in, in, this, in this framework I'm using, you can't say I'm uh, taking California from the grid, but I'm, you know, I'm just buying the wind power uh, that's on the other side. Here, this is saying whatever comes off that grid, you're, uh, well, I'm, I'm not really, you know, this is, this is more of a technical uh, work, you know, so I'm not, I'm not really thinking about responsibility, but basically, well, you know, the way I am, really what I care about is uh, what, what, what's the power on that grid? Yeah. So 
So that's how I do the matching. Okay. But actually, um, so the first, and, and actually thanks for the plug. The, 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 so the first set of maps I was showing, I was doing exactly what you said just there. I was looking at all the power plants in a given balancing area. How much are they putting onto the grid? And saying, okay, that's the electricity generated and the emissions. And then I was looking at uh, uh, exchanges of electricity to compute carbon uh, consumption-based carbon intensity. Mm -hmm. Here, so so this map is uh, is live, and, and so how I get to this map is what I wanted to uh, talk about next. Um, and in this map, I'm actually so the first one I was looking at what you would call a direct emissions estimate for the uh, consumption-based intensity of the uh, of electricity. Here, this would be a life cycle analysis-based estimate. And the difference here is that I'm not looking at individual power plants to make this one. Here, what I'm looking at is how much power from different generation sources was produced in each uh, in each balancing area. And then I have an emissions factor associated with um, each of the uh, generation technologies to say what are the emissions in that uh, in that plant. And you, yeah, if we have time, so there, there are ways to do a bit of both at the same time that we're exploring. Um, so why do I want to show this? Okay, so 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 this um, this web, yeah. So, so so this is kind of the end result. What I wanted to get at, and this thing. So this thing, if you update, basically you can see it was updated uh, a couple of hours ago. You know, and so it's an update sort of. Uh, basically, it's updated every hour, and there's a small time lag. But so how I how I get there is what I wanted to talk about next. Uh, so I'm going to talk about regions. So, so basically, what I, what I, the way I think about the power system here, uh, I guess to come back to the, the question just before, I'm thinking about a network. So, or think of a graph. If you're, if a graph is something that uh, you like thinking about, you know. So I have a set of nodes, set of regions. Uh, uh, then I have a set of generation uh, sources in each region. And so, some of the data I'm getting from uh, the EIA is I know how much electricity is consumed in each region. I know how much generation. Um, there is in each region. I know how much I'm producing from each generation source. I know what are the exchanges. Uh, so total, you know, so like the net uh, exchanges with uh, uh, for a, a region. I know the transfers, um, and then so W. Uh, I guess is just a, a weight parameter here. Uh, I'll talk about that later. Um, so when I'm when I'm looking at data on this network, there are a certain set of strengths that I know uh, to be true. Like I know. That the total generation at uh, a node should be equal to uh, the, the generation from each of the different um, sources. I know that uh, the interchange matrix, so if I, if I have a matrix where um, uh, index ij is the transfer from uh, region i to region j, I know that matrix should be antisymmetric. Um, and I know that uh, the sum of each row should add up to uh, the total interchange for uh, the corresponding region. Um, I know. Uh, that each node there should be energy conservation. So whatever I'm um, consuming in that, sorry, sorry, taking out whatever I'm consuming here, plus everything I'm, uh, so TR here, so the total exchange, I can mention that's net uh, uh, imports. You know, so everything I'm importing has to be uh, e uh, uh, equal to everything I'm, I'm producing in that node. Sorry, just, can you hold it just a second? Um, and so the, so, so, what I, so I said I wanted to reconcile the data. So basically I'm getting these data where initially each of these um, equations is not necessarily met by the raw data. And so what I'm doing, so the deltas here are variables that I'm adding on top of data adjustments to say, I want to change the data, uh, the unclean data to clean them. And the, so, and, and basically I'm, I'm minimizing um, what's called an L2 norm. I, I'm minimizing the square or the weighted sum of the squares of these adjustments. And let me not go into the, the weights maybe here. And, and I'm doing this so that I have at the end a set of clean data where, uh, uh, where I'm meeting these relationships. And the, so, so and, and the reason I care about this is to solve my linear system. So remember I said I had two steps to compute uh, uh, to get to uh, the web app I was showing you. The first step was I'm getting data and I need to clean it. And then the second step is I want to, uh, to solve my linear system to get the color basically on the max. That linear system, if the data that are coming in don't meet these equations, I get into all sorts of numerical issues and you know, basically it, my code throws a bug and it's not happy and, you know, and it crashes. If I solve this optimization program to get the data to match, then I have something that, uh, uh, that solves and, and, uh, and so I'm happy. 
So to give you a sense for how this is happening, and so and so this is happening online. So every um, every hour, basically, I have a server that goes and pulls new data, solves this optimization program that now becomes the new reference data for that hour, and then uh, well then pushes it to the to the web app so you can uh, visualize it, and you know then the next hour it does it again. And when new data comes in, so that's one of the nice things here is um, is actually in the data that's coming from the EIA. Basically, they're pulling data from the different balancing areas. So, uh, and some of the balancing areas give you data with time lags, and some of the, some of them have holes. As data is backfilled, as you get better data, the the algorithm you know just like regenerates better estimates. So, you know, better data just continuously improves. But at least you have a first guess uh, with which to base yourself. And so the plots are a bit small, but so this is this is showing you uh, one week's worth of results for. November of 2019 for SOFO, which is one of the balancing areas sort of in the middle south of the country. Um, and so what you can see on the top left, that's for uh, total generation, uh, sorry, total demand. And uh, so basically the parts where you don't have little blue dots, those are uh, parts where in the raw data that for, you know, for that balancing area, you have missing data, you know, so you, and this is uh, six days worth of data. So there's at least two or three days if you look at the top left, there are data that were missing. And so what the, um, I didn't go through all the different steps, but uh, the algorithm first makes a first guess. You have to have a first guess to initialize the algorithm based on uh, prior data. And that's what's uh, showed in, in, uh, in the small dash line. You can kind of see it around November 5th on the top plot of the left. And then uh, you solve the optimization uh, uh, program to say, how do I adjust the data so that it matches with everything that's around it? And that's the what I have in, in green. And you can kind of see that you know sometimes you, you change from the raw data you see you don't agree, and that means you want it to match something else. And so these are these different plots are showing you uh, so uh, demand generation total interchange. Well, I guess maybe just to say a, a tiny bit about that one. So that's the plot on the top right there. Uh, and so blue is demand, uh, orange is generation, um, green is total interchange, and the red. Is uh, the the energy balance constraint? So that's demand plus total interchange minus generation. And what we can kind of see is uh, here is it is is once the data has been cleaned, the the that's now uh, zero. And before it, so if you look in the raw data, what, what one reason I chose this period I thought it was interesting is if you look in the raw data over here from uh, November second to fifth, there was data and the energy balance constraint. Was verified. So if you looked at demand plus uh, total interchange plus generation, that all added up to zero. So good. But then if you look at this, so you know, then here there was just missing data. You know, so no, no data was supplied by uh, the EIA. So you know that's something I have to do something about. And then over here, and if you look at the raw data, if you look at this um, this uh, uh, red curve down here, that was slightly uh, negative. You know, so so the constraint was not verified. So that's also something that would throw off. The linear system I'm going to solve. You know, so these are two different types of issues. And basically, by the time you've gone through uh, this algorithm to reconcile the data, you have data that match uh, uh, the constraints both for energy balance, but also constraints for interchange and, and the sum. You know, so these are all the neighbors basically of uh, SOCO. And if you sum over the neighbors of SOCO and the corrected data, it's now going to match uh, the TI line. Uh, and if you look at generation by source and you sum that up in the corrected data, it's going to match uh, total generation, um, et cetera. And so I wanted to give you maybe another example of how uh, the algorithm is, is doing this to give you a sense of, of what's happening. And, and this is also sort of a sensitivity check for me. So here I, I took data from uh, the California ISO. So that's what SISO uh, stands for here. Um, and so I took real data. And, what I, and I took out some data, you know. So I, so I took uh, here uh, ten ways, ten days worth of data on November tenth, uh, first through tenth. And in the plot on the top, I just deleted five days to try to see how the algorithm recovers to get a sense for that. And so the whole part here was missing. You can see uh, the dashed line there is the um, first guess. The orange there is my reconciled data. So once I've solved I solved my my optimization program and everything, that would be my new data. And the blue here is the source, source of truth. So that's what the actual data was. So what this tells you is it's not perfect, but you know, I basically recover after, you know, if I, if I just take out all that data, I'm, the orange is pretty close to the uh, blue, which tells me 
uh, um, you know, the, it's not doing such such a bad job. And then the bottom here is I just said, okay, I'm just going to remove the whole thing. You know, just remove 10 days worth of data for demand. And what this tells you is, well, by using data on generation, exchanges, everything else, you can reconstruct the missing one. And one of the reasons this is super valuable is, um, well, when you get when you look at the raw data that's coming from the EIA, it's never the same balancing area that has missing data. You know, it's like one a couple hours here, a couple hours there for some channel, some other channel. In the original work I talked about, I did all the data cleaning by hand, and it took me three months. Um, this one, uh, what was nice is, you know, well, now that I've done this, it just runs uh, online and it, and it corrects it for me. Yeah. What causes all the missing data gaps? They're just like the world, or I mean, the world isn't like people just being unorganized, or is it just like I think sensors going offline. Like what? I mean, I guess my my experience is as soon as you start working with real data, you're going to have bad data. You know, I, I just I I don't think I've ever talked to someone who works with real data and you know in their sort of daily life where they they don't have issues like this. And why? Uh, you know, it's like the data glitches. Uh, it can be um, so. Sometimes there are uh, uh, systematic issues, like um, some things you can see when you look at the ISO data. Is uh, part of the solar generation uh, looks like it's count. You know, it's like depending on which source you're looking at, is counted in California versus uh, in Nevada. You know, so that that's something where you think, okay, like that's something we can go fix. And it'll be better. But sometimes, you know, when it's like two hours missing data, is it uh, the system in in the ISO that was there where there was a bug? Is it somewhere in the database? Is it in my system? You know, it's like they're, they're I think one of the difficulties is there are multiple layers of software systems that are uh, talking to each other here. And I think as soon as you have that, uh, it just becomes, uh, uh, yeah. I just don't think when, whenever you're working with real data, you should just assume there are going to be issues. Yes. Um, I was just curious how you're doing with um, two factors. So why are you dealing with losses uh, related to sort of getting you know, from generation points to in one specific points. Um, and then also um, curtailment. So if you're using renewables, you might generate 100 megawatts, but you're actually only going to give in 60 megawatts if that's, if that's what you can inject at that point. So how are you allowing those two? Well, so for the curtailments, maybe let me, so for the curtailments, if you are if you were going to generate 100 megawatts, but that's curtailed that sent to the ground, I think you know that basically never leaves the power plant. So, so in, the, in the data that I'm getting here, I'm just looking at, well, well, I guess my easy answer is I'm just looking at the data that the, energy, the EIA is giving me. So in a way, that's kind of their problem. <laughs> uh, but well, it's just in yeah. this way, you, you, you look at data which you consume. Exactly, and, and that- Because that's the beauty of consumption based. Okay. So, so it's after, you know, it's like, it's, it's after the losses and after everything. So, okay. so, so I, in other words, I don't separate that out. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and I don't have an easy way to do that. But uh, yeah, I, I just look at what's coming out okay. at the end. And then, or, or I guess or for the first one, for the, um, I guess one thing, no, I could say one thing more on that for the losses, I think that in this data set is basically accounted for in the, um, in the, in the exchanges, in the transfers. Yeah. So, okay, I guess back to some uh, results to give you a sense of, you know, what, what kind of uh, stuff comes out of this. And, and all of these are plots that are, uh, are generated on that web app I was I was showing, um, and, we, and we released all the code to do this. Um, so uh, this is showing. So the top is uh, uh, LA, and the, uh, so LA has its own uh, little balancing area, and uh, Kaiso is the bottom. And you can kind of see it's symmetric here. So um, blue is demand. Uh, that orange color is generation. Uh, the green is imports, and this is showing carbon intensity uh, for these different. Uh, for these two different places, and uh, the the full line that's the weekly average of the uh, the weekly median of the data, and then the uh, the shaded regions you can see that's the uh, tenth to ninetieth percentile to give you a sense of the spread. And so one thing you can see is kind of in LA the power that they uh, produce is much dirtier than the power that they consume because they, they the power that they import is much cleaner, and it's it's the opposite in California. And in California, so one thing that's interesting to me in California is you can see the, so that, that was one of the numbers I was initially, when I started all this, I was trying to get is the carbon intensity of imports for California. Uh, because at the time, there was basically the standard number, you know, like one fixed number that uh, uh, when you looked at CARB, uh, the California Air Resources Board, 
one number for imports that they were using that was always the same. And you know, so initially my question was, you know, is that is that a good number? How much does it change? You can actually see the carbon intensity of imports. So this is about uh, three years worth of data. Um, it changes quite a bit. You know, it changes from uh, here maybe peaks around 400 and all the way down to 200. You know, so from like one to two uh, uh, is the difference in, in the carbon intensity of imports, and that just depends on what the other things that were on that grid. So, you know, to come back to this style of heat map I was showing for uh, Stanford, uh, Stanford's electricity consumption. So here again, every column is a day of the year. These are all for uh, 2020, and every row is an hour of the day. Um, and, and, and the color here is the carbon intensity, consumption-based carbon intensity of the grid in these different areas. And you can kind of see, uh, so California, you know, the top right, you can really see the impact of, of solar there. You know, and, and, and actually when you look at these heat maps year by year, you can kind of see it changing, which I think is nice. Uh, if you look at uh, the Midwest uh, independent system operator, uh, so there you see their power is much dirtier in the, um, in the summer when there's a lot of AC than it is in the winter. It actually gets, you know, in the middle of the night in the, um, in the, in like March, 2021, uh, it actually gets pretty uh, clean. Sorry, I said this was for 2020. This is 2021. So th this is basically last year. Um, and, and one thing that's different from a uh, Midwest independent system operator to California independent system operator is that uh, um, in, in their case, the night tends to be cleaner than the uh, a day, whereas for us, it's the opposite. Um, that's also true, although you can't quite see it here. You can see it better in the raw data for uh, ERCOT. Um, actually, maybe I was looking at another year. But yeah, so for, for ERCOT, that's Texas on the bottom left, and then Southwest uh, power pole on the bottom right, which I think is, that one I think is interesting because you see a big variation um, uh, seasonally. Uh, you know, if you look at March there versus August, you see a really big difference in the carbon intensity of their, of their grid, which tells you, you know, so if we start moving towards a grid there where things are changing like that, well, starting to do uh, some, some, uh, some what we were calling carbon aware scheduling is really going to start to uh, matter to take advantage of this. So what's behind this, of course, is uh, uh, what, what we're putting onto the grid. And so what's also, uh, um, what's also available on, on this uh, web app I was showing is uh, the generation mix by source uh, um, for, uh, or generation by source, the generation mix for each of these areas. And so, you can, so basically these maps uh, or these uh, time series plots uh, are, are, are the explanation for the generation side of things on the, the plots I was showing before. And then if you add in uh, the imports, uh, that, that tell you, kind of completes the picture. And let me finish with this perfect. Um, so, you know, a couple of quick time, uh, uh, takeaways, you know, for some of the questions I was asking going into this, uh, and you know, on the sort of, does it matter question, which I think is one of the first questions you should always start before when you're working on a research project. Well, here I think, yes, it does matter because uh, the carbon intensity of consumed electricity varies in time and in space. For um, imports, I think the answer is it depends. If you're looking at, and you can kind of see it from the map here, if you're in a place uh, in the WEC, like in California, your imports matter a great deal. The number for uh, 2016, that first paper I was talking about, is I think California imported in 2016 roughly a third of its electricity consumption, or PISO did, and um, about 40% of the CO2 emissions associated with electricity consumption in California or elsewhere. So if you care about the carbon intensity of your grid in California, you really care about uh, the imports and, and measuring that. If you're in a place like the Midwest independent system operator, much less of a difference because it's sort of one big balancing area where everything's internalized. So for the imports, I think the question is, or the answer is it depends. Um, and then, and so here I'm, I'm talking more about uh, uh, current and, and uh, uh, sort of ongoing and future work, um, the fossil fuel plants play a key role in integrating uh, the renewables. And, and you start to see that when you're looking at a uh, day like these, where you're seeing uh, the, the renewables going up and down and the fossil fuel plants going up and down. And one of the questions I'm very interested in today is understanding how the renewables impact uh, uh, the fossil fuel plants um, and, you know, and, and how will that continue to impact them in the future in places where we start to have more and more uh, uh, solar and, and wind-based uh, generation. And so a lot of this work is trying to provide tools uh, to track, you know, these are these are measurement tools uh, to try to uh, track what's happening uh, um, in, the, in the power system. And 
Okay, and I'll stop here. I guess, yeah, and, and if, if you want to learn more about this, um, we, we've written some stuff on it. And with okay. that, I'm happy to take questions. questions in the Q and A. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, the different utility electric carbon factors. Do you look at the policy? Uh, do you look at the policy margin? Sixty percent of PS policy means gas cannot exceed forty percent of new supply as electric loads grow. Or do you use backward looking historic what supply the old loads? I'm I'm not looking at um, uh, at decisions here. I'm just looking at uh, historical data. Uh, what happened on the grid. So, you know, this is really just measuring what happened. And then for the second one, so everything, so I didn't uh, talk about the, thanks for the plug, I didn't talk about the difference between marginal and average carbon density here. And all the plots that I showed today are about uh, what's called average uh, emissions factors. So, and uh, so here, the question that I'm asking is what's the footprint of electricity consumption? And to answer that question, what I care about is the average carbon density. The marginal is. Yeah, I want to add uh, we will have uh, another talk. I don't know, it's uh, April 28th, Lizzie, or which day, uh, from Professor Ines Azuduo. Okay, she's yeah. going to talk about uh, you know, marginal uh, carbon emission factor, the yeah. research Perfect. that uh, she has been doing for many years. Yeah, so Ines will do a much better job than I will talk about that. You can compare, you know. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and we're working, so like, is the good news is. Yeah, she's at Stanford, and so now I'm working with her. So, so another thing I want to deliver to students, if you're interested in this topic, no yes. emission factor, whatever average or marginal, the work we are going to do is kind of consolidate these two things together. You know, have a comparison, what's the difference? It's the same source of data, you can show the difference between average versus marginal carbon emission factor. And uh, we're thinking about do more than just the United States. People can have this kind of global emission Tracking system that will be very interesting to a lot of users. I do have a talk to you in three weeks. In three, three weeks, weeks. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from the students? Yeah. Are there plans to track other uh, greenhouse gases like methane emissions? Is that even possible? I'm not sure. Um, so not methane. So 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 there is so criteria air pollutants are also so in the first thing I was also looking a lot at that. So and this is not other greenhouse gas emissions. This is more uh, uh, air quality uh, questions. Um, and uh, and so these are uh, the criteria air pollutants are typically associated with uh, uh, coal and and gas. So these are uh, sulfur and uh, nitrous uh, uh, oxides. So those uh, we we were looking at, at as well. I just didn't talk about it here. For the methane, I have no idea. Uh, for the methane, I think it's uh, well. Actually, sorry, sorry, I do have an idea. So, so in the um, in the data, so methane is uh, an emission. Yeah. So, so I guess one thing that, that we are thinking of doing here is to generalize this framework for uh, getting the you know the 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 content of electricity uh, for X. You know, where X could be methane could be. Uh, um, could be so, uh, uh, criteria air pollutants, uh, but also things like uh, so. I, I recently did some work for someone who was interested in water. What's the water footprint of electricity consumption? You know, and so I basically I modified the what was in here to get the uh, that out. Um, and so basically, yes, if you have, if you can give me uh, um, uh, something in units of you know gallons of water per megawatt hour, then I can plug it through this and get something at the end for the methane specifically. Um, actually, I said I don't know, but I do know. That's in the uh, in the EPA data. They also measure uh, uh, CH4. Put this question to three weeks. Ask Ines again, and uh, she will may also give you some ideas as well. So. Um, yeah. Are you looking at all into factoring in things like T rex, the time based renewable energy credits, and how that will affect these curves? So I'm not so much thinking about uh, factoring that in. As much as I think this kind of work informs uh, the design of tools like that, mm -hmm. you know. So, so, so this, you know, like things like T-Rex, that's about uh, accounting and responsibility, and you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, basically, if you had a, if you want to put carbon on your balance sheet, is the way mm -hmm. I see it, and see how it impacts your bottom line if you put a price on it. Um, this is really just about measurement. You know, all, all of this work is about trying to say uh, how much CO2 is there uh, in the electricity that you're getting out of the socket. Um, you know, and so then, you know, then if you want to use that for something uh, uh, for, for T Rex, then, yeah. So I think it's very related in that, in, in that way. The one thing that I haven't worked on 
uh, so much. Uh, um, but I think is a difficult topic, honestly, is how do you assign responsibility? Which, which I think you know is what people are trying to do with the QX or you know, or, or I guess the whole discussion around marginal versus average emission factors is also about that. Um, and that I think um, I think the 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 answer unfortunately is not so easy. <laughs> and not as easy as some people say. I'll just say that. Yeah. Um, when you showed the map of the like carbon intensity across like the country, I, I believe it looked as if um, the East Coast had like much higher carbon intensity than the West Coast. Um, do you know why that is? So it depends where. Well, I, so I guess that goes back to the, the last picture. Can I share my screen again? The last picture I was showing about uh, generation sources. So the Northwest of the country has a lot of hydro. Power. Um, and so that's actually a lot of the, uh, what's clean up here. Um, and over here, and so over here and over here, you have uh, some nuclear, you have some, uh, some gas. One of the things, one of the things that's making uh, you know, these uh, uh, colors go more towards the red is coal. And coal, there's a lot of uh, around here. Um, um, uh, WACMA has a lot of uh, coal. And then uh, you have some around here as well. So, you know, it, it, it's basically to do with generation sources. The Northeast also has quite a lot of hydro, and the imports in the Northeast are super clean because they're coming from Canada. Uh, and that's uh, and what's coming over that line. A lot of it is, is produced by hydro on the other side. All okay. right. And is there any particular reason why there's like tends to be more coal, like in these regions, because of like legislation or regulations? Like that? So, why there's more, more coal in the Middle East? Yeah, or like, and then also I see them in Florida too. I think a lot of that has to do with historical reasons, yeah. like the coal mines. That's where they are. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Uh, yeah. I don't think that has to do with the uh, regulation. I think the. Uh, yeah, I don't know enough about coal, but I, but I, but I think there's I mean there's a lot of mining for coal in in those regions, and it's just pretty close by. Oh. So this. Uh, this consumption-based carbon intensity, it's getting measured as like a consumer, or is this is this like a life a life cycle carbon so, measurement? So yeah, so I, so I talked a tiny bit about that earlier. So this map, the one that's live, yeah. is life cycle analysis based, okay. but it's looking at uh, sort of the life cycle analysis uh, estimate for CO two associated with the electricity you're taking out of uh, uh, out of the, the plug. So it's a consumer perspective. Looking at life cycle analysis, you could uh, so I was actually talking about this with Anesh earlier this week. Um, you could so the, the first one was looking at direct emissions. So uh, so the SEMS, the continuous emissions mining systems, those are on the stacks in the power plants. So that's actually measuring what's coming out. And so the first maps I was showing you know, with the same color scheme was just looking at how much is coming from just burning stuff. So it's not full life cycle. Um, so I don't have a good sense for how different the two are. That's what we were talking about with Anesh. And what she told me, you know, maybe ask her again the question in three weeks, but what she was telling me on Monday is for her, most of the emissions are associated with the fuel burning. And the process, uh, you know, actually for like things like coal and gas is actually, you know, maybe 10, 15 percent. So uh, um, so the direct emissions estimates should be all, you know, already like almost everything. Yeah, for for coal and, you know, those, it's been interesting yeah. to see like, you know, transporting a truck. First pipeline or something like that. Well, well so so, so that, that, that's supposed to be all accounted for in the life cycle. Um, but then it's also for like you know solar panels and right. farms. So it's also included. So well, so yes, so so well, and these numbers I'm using here, this is sort of all in number. Yep. So here, for instance, um, so so the numbers that are behind this, uh, solar and wind are not zero. Yep. They're they're and uh, uh, they're they're more like a, a forty kilograms per hour or fifty. Yeah. Okay, so I, I don't remember that. Yes. But yes. So you kind of lump all that in with uh, like price per kilogram, one kilogram CO2 per. The price per Sorry, not price. I meant just kilogram CO2. Oh, yes, yes. So, 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 so this is all lumped in. Um, um, you're talking about emissions factors. Yeah. Yeah, this picture. So here, it's so this is the all in number, you know, sort of uh, everything into uh, kilogram CO2 per megawatt hour. And so, um, but so what, what Nesh was on me on Monday is the. Uh, for the coal, for instance, that thousand ninety percent of that is just the direct emissions estimate. For for you're right for the solar and the wind, you know, it's probably you know everything is basically the life cycle because there are no emissions when you're uh, well, unless you count things like operating emissions. You know, like if you have to clean the solar panel and count those emissions. 
but really there are very little operating issues. It's mostly about uh, uh, the manufacturing and the, and the supply chains on the coal and the gas. Almost everything is on when you burn the stuff. It's kind of fascinating that they're all pretty similar. At the bottom? Yeah. Well, well, actually, you know, some of them are like double the others. Okay. The reason I say they're similar. Some or similar. Right? Exactly. I, I, so I think that the number of it, so these are, well, so here I was looking at IPCC 2011, but actually there are uh, IPCC 2018 numbers that are more recent. And it's, um, you know, it's like 12 to uh, 50 or something. You know, so 12 to 50, like when you're looking at one to one, that's a big difference. But when you're looking, compare that to 450 for gas, um, it's, you know, it's like a, the way I see it, it's another zero. But then, yeah, there's none that's five and 150. There's not an order of magnitude difference between any of those. Uh, there's not like a five and a 50, it's like 15, yeah. 15. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yes? So as you kind of been talking about, this really gets at like the measurement issue of tracking emissions. Um, and to your knowledge, do you know if any of these results or data are actually being used by independent system operators at the moment or any players? Um, to actually optimize imports versus exports to minimize carbon emissions, or are there any plans or steps for that to happen in the future? Uh, that's a lot of questions I like to one. Um, <laughs> so, are they looking at this? Yes, and more and more. Like, if you go to the, so like a, uh, yeah, like if you go to like the today's outlook for Kaiso, uh, I guess you can show you that real quick. You will see that. They, yeah, and they didn't used to do this, so you know, so so they care Kaiso. Uh, today's outlook, you'll see that now they, they do have carbon emission. Yeah, now they have it. Yeah, exactly. If you go here to California, so this is uh, California. So that was what I was calling uh, CISO in my plots. So they have a their their estimate. But you know, so here, you know, now they give you the same way they tell you what's demand and supply. They also tell you CO two emissions. And so here, uh, so I don't know if they've updated, but so it's going like initially like what was you know feeding into that imports was you know what kind of got me started into all of this um but you know they're they're so i guess they care uh well they care enough to you know set this up uh whether they're optimized so i don't know whether they're like actually changing the scheduling to take this no, no i don't think ISO does but uh, some iso like your know, iso really think about how to put the price out of carbon and they have that to impact their dispatch so some going on kind of research early demonstration work at your know, iso Mm -hmm. okay, so no, yeah. I think yeah, we're, we're not at the price. I think we're at the we're starting to be at the tracking stage. We're not, I think we're not yet at the pricing stage. Okay. So thank you. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Our next seminar is in two weeks. And uh, this is you know we'll talk about how to use the uh, central image to for the application. Thanks for hanging.